You don't have to be taught them. From a child, you begin to intuit them. Individuality, you knew that you were not your brother. You knew that you were not your sister. You knew that you were not your parents. You, you're, you, the most fundamental reality to human experience is that you are an entity, right? Th this goes back to Rene Descartes when he was beginning to wonder what we could firmly base a philosophical system on. And he finally famously said, I think, therefore I am. When you reduce life back to its most fundamental axiom, every one of us knows that we are an individual and that we are not somebody else. You are who you are and you are no one else. Our individuality is something that we cannot not, it's something that you can't, you, 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 it's impossible to not imagine it. And let me give you an illustration. I'm not doing a good job here. You cannot imagine your own funeral. Okay? Has anyone here ever tried to imagine their own funeral? I mean, most people have. Okay, I have. The problem is, is that you're, it's not real. You're not actually able to do it because you're there seeing it. Right? You cannot imagine your own non-existence because you're there imagining it. You follow? So, so, so the idea of your non-existence is something you can't even conceive of. The only sense in which you can conceive of your non-existence is if you think about the past. You can, you can imagine times that you, I certainly didn't exist at the time that Alexander the Great existed. I, I know that. But here I am aware of the fact that I never existed in the time of Alexander the Great. It's impossible for David Asterisk or anybody to get around the, the most basic notion of our, of our existence and our fundamental individuality. Coupled with the second most fundamental thing to us, and that is freedom. And, and children know very early on, and mothers figure out very early on, as do fathers, that, that children know what they want, even if they can't communicate it very well. They know what they want, and they're going to do whatever they can within their little sphere of influence, whether it's, you know, two months or two years, to get what they want. Am I wrong or am I right? So before a child can ever say anything, communicate in language, he or she understands freedom intuitively, incorrigibly. A child understands natively, hey, I want whatever that is. I want to do this. And if you, if you make a child do something they don't want to do, they understand that their freedom is being restricted and they don't like it. Now, you and I, we're no longer children, but we know this, and this is easily illustrated. If, you and, if I was just walking down the street or you were walking down the street. Just imagine you're walking down the street, any street, anywhere, and somebody reaches out to you, walking, you know, say somebody's coming at you, and as you walk by, they reach out to you and start with force, with strength. A man, a grown man, grabs you and starts pulling you in an, against your will, starts pulling you in an opposite direction. You won't think, you know, this is, I don't want this. I don't, not really wanting to go with this strange bearded man in a stinky flannel shirt. I, um... I think I'm going to resist now. No, you will, before you ever entertain any ideas about the nature of your freedom and where this guy is taking you, you will instinctively resist. Y you follow that? Because you know intuitively that to, to have your, fr your freedom impinged upon is something you don't like. When we punish criminals, how are criminals usually punished? By the restriction of their freedom. Because we understand that to limit somebody's freedom is to take away in some sense their personhood, to take away in some sense their individuality, to in some sense take away the thing that makes them human. Are you with me on that? And so number one, your individuality, number two, your freedom, and number three, love. And I'm going to really talk about that tomorrow, so I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to skip over risk because I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. And number four, or number five, meaning I've already talked about. These are things that we take for granted. We just assume these basic realities about our life, individuality, freedom, love, risk, and meaning. We'll pick it up tomorrow. In the words of Lewis, again, to, be, to love at all is to be vulnerable. And by the way, that is true whether you are a human or God. That is true even for God. I'm going to talk to you a little bit tomorrow about a book I'm reading right now, a brand new book just published 2015 by a man named Dr. John Peckham. And he wrote a book called The Love of God, a canonical model, mind-blowing, Seventh-day Adventist scholar, mind-blowing book. And uh, one of the things that he's exploring in this book is the, the intrinsic vulnerability that is part of loving, not only to humans, and every one of us in this room, if you've ever had your heart broken, you've ever been betrayed, you've ever had a child lie to you, we know that the moment we extend ourselves in love, there is an inherent and essential vulnerability that comes with that love. Are you with me on that? And what, what, what Peckham brings out, what Lewis brings out here, is that that's true for God too. God is making himself vulnerable in love. And you'll see this at the end. I've got to hurry up. Love anything, says Lewis, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. 
If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one. Don't give your heart to anyone. Here's, here's how you keep your heart intact. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock your heart up in a safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, your heart will change. But it will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. It will become impenetrable. It will become irredeemable. You see, the only way to protect your heart from vulnerability is to create a situation where your heart becomes something it was never created to be, and that is stony and, and not extending. There is a, there's an inherent strength and yet an inherent vulnerability in love and reaching out to someone else. And Scripture communicates this in three basic ideas. In fact, these are the three basic ideas that are foundational to the whole Bible. People say to me, what's the Bible about? And there's a couple different ways to answer that question. There's two answers I like to give when people say to me, what is the Bible about? One answer I like to give is, the Bible is the story of God making promises to a man named Abraham and his descendants and then keeping those promises. That's the story of Scripture in a nutshell. God making promises to Abraham and his descendants and then keeping those promises. That's one way to say it. That's sort of the narrative way to say it. The thematic way to talk about what the Bible is is the three words that you see on the screen there. The Bible tells the story of creation, which we've been exploring in Genesis 1 and 2. It tells the story of conflict, which we're going to pick up tomorrow in depth. And it tells the story of covenant, which is simply another way of saying relational faithfulness. That there was creation, that there was conflict, and there is relational fidelity. That God has, in an act of inherent vulnerability, extended himself. As we learned last night from Alvin Plantinga, the gospel is not just a nice story. Plantinga said it's the most beautiful story that could ever be told. And remember, I gave you homework. Try to imagine a better story. There isn't one. You cannot conceive of a better story than the story that Scripture tells, which is the basic story of God giving himself. And we're going to see this in just a second. I've got to hurry this up. Reason number four. Jesus came from God and is God, and he's really awesome. Sometimes you just got to say it like it is. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, If you have seen Me, you have seen the Father, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned last night, if God looks like Jesus, that's really good news. If God looks like somebody who finds a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and who says to her, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more, he sees a future for her, he sees a possibility for her that she cannot even see for herself. If God will sit down with a publican, a tax collector, if God will sit down with a Pharisee named Nicodemus and interact with him, if God will speak to a hated publican named Zacchaeus and go eat dinner at his house, if God will speak to a Roman centurion who was hated because he was a Gentile, doubly hated because he was a Roman, triply hated because he was a Roman soldier, and quadruply hated because he was a leader of soldiers, if Jesus can say to this guy, I've not seen so great faith in all of Israel, if God looks like that, that is really good news. In fact, it's the greatest conceivable good news. And as I mentioned last night, can you think of a better, more beautiful story? I'll answer that for you. The answer is no. Okay, number five. Now, I, I wish I had an hour to talk about what I'm going to talk about here in the next 10 minutes. 10 minutes. If my son was here, he'd be laughing his head off. <laughs> All right, now this is going to require a little bit of thinking. One of the reasons that we can be sure that God is good is that the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is not a two-party, is a two-party arrangement, not a three-party arrangement. Okay, now you're sitting there going, you're making that face. You're making the... It's a little late for that, don't you think? Okay, let me explain what I mean by this. We just quoted John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's a verse that we all know and we all know well. But what do we do with this verse? Jeremiah chapter 19, 4 and 5. God says, speaking of Israel, They have forsaken me, and they have made this, Jerusalem, an alien place. God's city, He says. It's an alien place. It's a foreign place. I come here, I feel like I don't even belong in my own city, my own town. Among my own people. Well, why not, God? Why do you feel like a foreigner in your hometown? Well, because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known, and they have filled this place with the blood of innocence. More specifically, what do you mean? Verse 5. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, neither did it come into my mind. Now, let me just tell you what's going on here. In the ancient Canaanite religions, one of the ways that you could show your supreme devotion to the various gods of the Canaanite faith was by sacrificing your child. 
sacrificing your child to God. And God says, you know what? I came to, to my place, my city, my people, and I felt like a foreigner there because my own people began to participate in the actions of the Canaanites. They were offering their children as offerings. And he says, not only do I find that repugnant, not only do I find that absolutely disgusting and revolting, it never even came into my mind to ask for such a thing. Okay, but, but wait a minute. We just read a second ago that the good news is that God gave his son. But God here says, I never even imagined the idea of child sacrifice. So which is it? Which is it? Is it John 3.16 or is it Jeremiah 19? I mean, is the gospel the good news that God gave his son as a sacrifice? Or is the idea of child sacrifice something that never even entered into God's brain? So repugnant, so disgusting that it never even came into his mind. What's going on here? Well, most of us would have a difficult time answering that question, but I want you to understand just how crucially important this question is. And it is proof positive that God is good. All of this, of course, takes us back to that primordial story that's found in Genesis chapter 22 where God said the unthinkable to Abraham, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. I want to tell you something right now. Every person in this room, I can basically guarantee you, if you thought that God was telling you to sacrifice your son, you would not do it. I can, I can assure you I would not. If I had a voice that came to me that said to me, hey, go kill Landon, go sacrifice Landon, I would not do it. And I am 99% sure that no father or mother in this place would do it. Which raises the question, why was Abraham willing to do something that I wouldn't even consider? And here's why. Because in Abraham's cultural context, namely in the land of Canaan, this was the way that God, op this, this was the way that God's operated. I mean, if you really wanted to be devoted to God, you would bring a small offering. If you wanted to be super devoted, you increase the size of that offering. If you wanted to be supremely devoted, maybe you bring your best goat or your best cow or your best sheep, whatever it is. But what if you really, really, really want to show your devotion to a God? Well, that next logical step would be taken by the Canaanites, and they would offer not just their livestock, but their offspring. Now, it's a seemingly logical step, except that God says, I find that disgusting and repulsive, and I never ask you to do such a thing, so much so that it never even came into my mind. So why is God asking Abraham to do something that he says never even came into his mind because he finds it so revolting, and he finds it so revolting that he says when he comes to his people, he's a foreigner or an alien? Well, here's why. Abraham lived in a time, in a situation, and in a culture where this was the very kind of thing that God's asked people to do. Take your son and kill him. Show your real devotion to me. Show your real loyalty to me. Show your real obedience to me. And so Abraham, who has been in a covenantal relationship with God for years at this point, he would have scratched his head and said, man, I, 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 I guess I thought this God was different. But I guess not. Come on, Isaac. Let's go. And he begins to lead him through that three-day journey on his way to Mount Moriah. And all the while, all the while Mo Abraham is trying to make sense out of this seemingly incongruous command. God appeared to be good. He appeared to be kind. He promised descendants. Of course, there was the whole logistical nightmare of how am I going to have descendants if I'm killing the only you know, legitimate offspring that I have? There's all of that going on. And as they're making their way up the mountain, Isaac, young boy, probably not more than 14, somewhere between 14 and 17, he asks his dad a question. He says, hey, dad, there's the wood. Where's the lamb? Where's the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham preaches the gospel and he doesn't even know it. He says this, my son, God will provide, for a, God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering himself. Abraham doesn't know he's saying the gospel. He's just trying to delay. He's stalling. He doesn't know what to say, frankly. Uh, God will take care of this. God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering himself. But here's a remarkable thing. Keep a close eye on that screen because I'm going to insert a comma. And when I insert this comma, it is going to make the gospel-centered nature of this passage come alive for those of you that, that are really tuning in here. Watch this comma. My son, God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering himself. At just that moment on top of Mount Moriah, there was a ram that was caught in a thicket in the bush and the ram was slain and Isaac was spared. 
In a significant and wonderful way, then, Isaac does not really represent Jesus. He represents us because we're spared. And the ram represents Jesus. In answer to the question, hey, Dad, where's the ram? Where's the lamb? Where's the animal? Abraham said, God will have to provide this. God will provide a lamb himself. You see, friends, it looks like this. Which of these is the gospel? Is the gospel on the right or on the left? Is, is, the, is the gospel a three-party arrangement, God, Jesus, and sinners, or is the gospel a two-party arrangement, God and sinners? Now, let me just unpack that for you. Some of us have in, the mind, in our mind an idea that, though we might not articulate it this crudely, I'll give you the basic picture. We have this idea that God is upset. God is angry. He's wrathful against sin, and he's wrathful against evil, and he's going to pour out his wrath and his anger and his judgment on evil and sin. And because we are evil and we are sinners, God is going to pour out his wrath on us. But at just that moment when God is about to do that, someone else steps into the picture and says, no, no, I'll do it. And God's like, all right, well, I really want to pour out my wrath on them, but in Instead, I'll pour out my wrath on you, and my wrath and my anger will then be placated, and I will have cooled down so I don't have to take it out on them. This is a three-party arrangement. There's God, Jesus, and sinners. And God's initial wrath was on sin, sinners, and evil, but he redirects his wrath over to this third party to protect, or to the second party to protect the third party. I'm going to tell you right now, that is not the gospel. And not only is that not the gospel, that's not even good news. That's terrifying. It's, it's terrifying to think that, 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 that people conceive that is the essence of the gospel, that God is going to give somebody else a good whacking when he really wants to whack those people. No, 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 no. The gospel is not a three-party arrangement. The gospel is a two-party arrangement. You see, friends, Jesus is God. If, if, there's any, if, if it's anybody other than God hanging on that cross, that's not good news. The good news is that God himself, not some other party, God himself took the penalty and the consequence of sin upon himself to preserve those who were undeserving and who were in rebellion against him. You see, friends, the gospel isn't three. The gospel is two. And if Jesus isn't God, the gospel isn't good news. It's child sacrifice. That's what's happening in Jeremiah 19. In Jeremiah, ni Jeremiah 19, where God says, this never even came into my mind, that's one party sacrificing a second party to a third party. And God says, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's disgusting to me. The truth is, is that there's only two parties in this arrangement. There's God and there's sinners. And God in the person of his son, Jesus, who is fully and completely God in, in, the, in the most emphatic sense of what it means to be God, he laid down his own life. In fact, Jesus said it this way, no, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. I like to ask the question, who killed Jesus? Did the Romans kill Jesus? Did the religious leaders of Jesus stay kill Jesus? Did our sins kill Jesus? The answer is none of the above. Jesus laid down his own life. He said, no one can take my life from me. I lay it down voluntarily and I take it up again. He was not a third party or a second party that was sacrificed to appease. He was one of only two parties. There was God and there was sinners. And God took upon himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who was fully God, the consequences of our sin and our rebellion. And that is really, really, really good news. Greater love has no one than this, and a man than, than someone would lay down his life for his friends. The text doesn't say, greater love has no man than this, and a man would lay down the life of his friend. Oh, it was a wasp? Yeah. Oh, man, just like the enemy. <laughs> greater love has no man than this, and a man would lay down his life for one of his friends. All right, you made it. No, seriously, can you think of a better story than that? You can't. Reason number one, he created the universe and our world, and he made them very good. Number two, universally, we all crave meaning, goodness, and joy. We intuit this. We know this from, from the outset of our lives. We long for meaning. We long for joy. We long for freedom. Number three, our reality is compellingly explained in the context of God is love. I'll unpack that more fully in our session tomorrow, uh, the second session. Reason number three, 
Uh, Jesus came from God, and he is God, and this is really good news because Jesus is super cool and awesome. And number three, the gospel is not a, two par- not a three-party arrangement. The gospel is a two-party arrangement where God himself takes upon himself the responsibility of our sin. I can only say with Paul, for I am convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And final slide, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width. Get out of here. <laughs> what? Well, uh, it's like coming forward for an altar call here. What are you doing? <laughs> here he comes. Get behind me, wasp. Oh, he's coming back for more. I never had this happen before. I've had some weird things happen in my meetings, but never this. Okay, anyway, where was I at? What is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ? And I love this, which passes knowledge. I've done my best tonight in a long time. You've been very generous to communicate to you with, with my intellectual capacities and my research things that I find really compelling. But at the end of the day, Paul says, this love, this kind of love that we're talking about, it cannot be quantified in words. It cannot be quantified in academics. It cannot be quantified in knowledge. It passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's been great to be with you. Let me close with prayer. Father in heaven, beautiful people in this ro- room, uh, and, and yet, we are people broken. And, um, but in our brokenness, Father, as we've mentioned here, you love us. You know us perfectly and love us genuinely. And Lord, this is an astonishing thing. It's a thing that we can scarcely come to grips with. And uh, tonight, I just want to pray for every person here, for that person that's suffering, struggling, wondering, doubting. Um, Father, just give them a sense that life is a beautiful, meaningful thing that you have created for good and that you want them to be a part of that. Whether small or great, Father, help us to be that puzzle piece, that uniquely shaped piece in this grand painting that that you're creating that only we can fill. And Father, help us to do that. And we look to you. We love you. But we know, Father, that that's not the big story. The big story is not our love for you, but your love for us. And uh, send us home tonight, hearts full with the breadth, height, width, depth of the love of God, the fullness of God shown to us in the man Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, n- nine o'clock, not bad, not bad. Ah, we're good, we're good, we're good. It'll be better tomorrow morning. You'll be out. Of, I, let me make a promise. Uh-oh. I make a Uh-oh. solemn promise. <laughs> Tomorrow, I will have you out of here by 8.30 p.m. (laughs) I think he's good for his word on that one. I think he's good for his word. Um, How many of you have been enjoying the meeting so far? How many of you would like to do better on the quiz next time? Okay, I'm going to tell you how you can do that. Um, Last night's programs are already up on our church website. It's franktownsda.org. And you can listen to them on there. Um, but we are also going to make available to you the video presentation or the audio presentation, which, whichever you would like, of the whole series. Um, you may have noticed that we have an awesome audiovisual crew who's been here each night. They'll be, they've been filming and recording the audio as well. And if you would be interested in having a copy of this and us sending this copy to you at the end when it's all said and done, right on the back, two tables where you had your snack in between the two meetings. Um, there are pens and paper, pen and paper, and you can fill out a, um, a short little piece of paper, and we can then send you the final copy, whichever you would like, audio or a DVD series um, that you can have so you can have it at home or you could share it with somebody who might enjoy the series as well. So on your way out, please take a moment, just head over to the table, fill out the information there, and we will be happy to share this with you so that you can do better on further quizzes later on at the beginning of our programs. Um, but you can check the, uh, the first two are already up on there. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and then 11.15 for part number two. Have a great evening and a safe trip home.